Uh, welcome everybody to Sturm & Drang Studio. Uh, this project is a um, joint research uh, made by Fondazione Prada Prada and ETH Zurich, uh, uh, curated by Freddy Fischli, Nils Solz and me, Luigi Alberto Cipini, uh, on um, uh, subjects, uh, matters, and uh, basically background research uh, dealing laterally on CGI technology, artist work, and general engineering patterns that are at place today in um, the sort of user-based distributed smart technologies that everybody can use but can also in a way change the way we see the world. So today uh, we are welcoming Bradley from Anthropology and uh, will be introduced uh, by Octave Perrault who is a dear friend and an architect that showed to us the, um, in a way the amazing and so also divergent patterns by which uh, software technologies and uh, ecosystems uh, can provide us a better grasp with the world of the things that are made and used every moment. So thank you, Brad, for being here. And thank you, Octave, for your needs for, you know, joining us in this discussion. Yep, thank you. Um, great, Luigi. Uh, so yes, I'm very pleased to uh, have Brad here uh, with you guys. Uh, Brad is a... Uh, the CEO and founder of Entopology, a uh, new advanced engineering and uh, manufacturing software. Um, and uh, Brad has a background as an architect and uh, he, he, he le was led to uh, develop this software uh, after playing with like the usual tools that architects and designers use. And, uh, but it's interesting because um, uh, the software is based on a new geometric paradigm, uh, which is a bit, unnatural for people who use uh, uh, usual softwares, but at the same time is closer to, um, to the way uh, the physical world functions. So somehow, um, you know, there is this, uh, this uh, I mean, this element of uh, innovation that uh, Brad has brought from architecture potentially, uh, I think uh, would be interesting to discuss in this context. Uh, so, I mean, without further ado, I think, uh, Brad, you can just maybe give a bit in, of an introduction about NTOP, the kind of key innovation in, in this and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, on how you got to develop them and approach them. Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 the key reason that Entopology exists is really to like enable engineers to build the most advanced products today. And the most advanced products today are built with, you know, new manufacturing technology, things like 3D printing, that digitize factory robots that are building stuff, not humans, you know, moving things and cutting them. And so, you know, the 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 foundation for NTOP existing was basically, you know, the last 15, 20 years, manufacturing's gone through kind of the biggest shift of the last, or at least my lifetime, you know, possibly even the last hundred years, which is the shift to the digitized factory, 3D printing, kind of leading the game with that, right? And you know, the many anytime there's a big shift in the way that we as humans make something, all of the design practices, all of the business practices, all of the kind of way that people work has to evolve to take advantage of that new technology. Whether it's like in architecture, the invention of like reinforced concrete, the way you design for that is very different than the way you design for like, you know, wood structures with joinery and stuff like that. And so, you know, the shift to 3D, 3D printing is like one next shift in manufacturing that opens up all these new applications. Problem is, you know, we were, we've still been using the same software that was created and invented in the late seventies, early eighties based on CAD technology, which, you know, CAD originally stood for computer aided drafting. It's how do you use the computer to make a better drawing? Not how do you use the computer like engineer a better part, but how do you make a drawing? And if you're trying to draw these parts that are as complex as things in the natural world, like a, you know, the bone of a bird or stuff like that, you, you, just, you just can't do it. Um, and so like a little bit on how I got to starting NTOP was like, you know, and I was in architecture school 2004, 2005, and we got a 3D printer for the first time. And I was like, oh my God, this is incredible technology. You know, you just send it a digital file from your 3D modeling software and it just builds it. Um, and, but the 3D modeling software, again, because it was like built for drawing and drafting, you had to like draw everything. And that was really, really difficult. It was really hard. And like the software was a blocker for me. So I ended up, I, I knew because I had like written, I had written code to extend AutoCAD in high school in this language, AutoLisp, you could actually write code to like change these programs around. 
I was like, okay, I'm going to find the program that has like the easiest to use API, which happened to be Rhino, not SolidWorks or any of the other programs out there. And I was like, I'm just going to write my own software and do this without having to be blocked by, you know, the, the CAD technology and drawing technology. So I started doing like, you know, make, looking at things that were like, okay, how would you 3d print structures like a, like joints to make, make things, or how would you print functional objects? Um, it's also funny in architecture school that like a lot of people were just making like little buildings on the 3d printer. And I knew when 95% of the people in architecture school were making little buildings, I was like, architecture is probably not the direction I'm going to go, even though I love architecture school. And I think it's a great way to study. Um, I was much more interested in like how this is really manufacturing technology. And that's how I ended up starting a software company. And how would you describe your visuality that you came up with for someone that does not know it? Or like, how would you compare it to other visuality? So in terms of the, how would I compare the software? So like that, so like very quickly, I realized the problem with the engineering software was actually the data model. Like how does the computer draw a shape on the screen and represent a shape, right? Like the all, if you look around you, everything around you that's been designed and manufactured has basically been built in like one of four different CAD systems. And those CAD systems are all based on the same underlying modeling technology, which is called boundary representation of BREP. And a BREP, like in very simple terms, is like just drawing the outside of the shape, right? So if you're making a wooden table, it draws the edges and the surface of the table, but it can't draw any of the stuff inside. And if you know, it's like, a, let's do a chair because you have to sit in a chair, but right? If you have a wooden chair, if you're just drawing the outside, you don't understand anything about the wood structure and the wood structure is what gives it its strength. Like, you know, if you made a chair out of balsa wood and sit on it, it's going to break. But if you made a chair out of like, I don't know, like maple, maybe do people make chairs out of maple? Okay. So if you make a chair out of maple, it's going to hold you up. Right. And the, what's it? They both look like wood in CAD. You draw the chair. It looks the same. And you make a tag that says, this is balsa wood. This is maple. And somebody builds it. Um, but if you're 3D printing that wood and you don't know like what you're starting with and you can make the material properties, maybe you want to change it. So like where your arms are, it's like more squishy and where your, the structure is, it holds you up. How would you do that with, if you're only drawing the outside and you're putting tags on the drawing, it's not possible. And so the, 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 the problem, if you look at this problem from like the first principles, right, the problem is not just like trying to add more information to this boundary representation drawing model, drawing based model. And the problem is actually the model itself. So you have to look into other ways of representing the shapes on the computer. And there's, you know, lots of different ways that you can represent the same shape mathematically. And that led us as a company to find this, to figure out that actually in computer graphics, the people doing the most amazing stuff in graphics are using this, this model modeling technology called sign distance field. Um, and what it is, is that the math for a sign distance field actually gives you a representation of like the full shape in 3D. So you have every single point inside and outside of the shape is captured within this equation. So what that allows you to do is actually model and represent structures that are like on the complexity of things like wood cells. So you could represent the entire structure of the wood and the outside of the shape at the same time. And so like, you might ask yourself, you might be like, hey, why didn't, why didn't CAD just build itself on this sign distance field modeling, right? Like from the beginning, why did we use this boundary representation? And the, the reason is for the sign distance field modeling where you can represent all these points in space, you absolutely need GPUs and multi-core computers to be able to render these in real time. And like, as a company, we actually weren't even we weren't rendering our models in real time up until the, the release that we just put out two weeks ago, 3.0. Like it's, it's that hard to actually render these sign distance fields in real time and make edits and stuff like that. Like we were fast, we were really quick, but now that we switched everything over to the GPU, it's like you can make a change and it just updates in real time. We can, we'll show some of that stuff. And what was the first kind of case study that you used at that time? The first application, so I, I like the term application because it's like a set of areas. And so 
Initially, it was looking into lattice structures, so structures where you have these repeated cells to come up with custom material properties. And so they actually the first, the first case study for NTOP was actually a shoe sole that our first application was a shoe sole and a shoe sole that where there's more pressure from the foot, it has a different material property. Like it's more, it's, it's less squishy than where there's less pressure, it's more squishy. And that's important because you can actually create like a more comfortable shoe by doing that. And, you know, a, a lot of it, you've probably seen some of the 3D printed shoe soles that are out there that change these material properties through that. So that was like very, very, very early on. Um, the software, the first version of the software, which is like in 2015, like it was like very, very, it was like this command line application that I was like going around to customer sites and like punching in numbers to get these shoe soles out. Um, second was a orthopedic implant. So like a bone implant that needed to like have bone grow into it. And then the third was actually like light weighting brackets for aircraft. So making a structure that holds like the jet engine underneath the aircraft is like a bracket and making that structure as light as possible and 3D printing it in metal. And a lot of our applications were tied to the manufacturing process. So like, you know, they were only like the 3D print, the shoe sole where you have the variable material properties too, that was like only possible with 3D printing. It wasn't an application that was possible before this new manufacturing. But, but I have a question, Brad. And so I, um, the purpose of this project is to basically sort of not really redefine, but to um, analyze and research all the different environment, uh, in a way, aggregation modes of all the people that are involved in, you know, computer generated images. And uh, the name of the project is Turmund Drang for a basic uh, reason is that, um, you know, today we see in renderings, you know, uh, excessively realistic, uh, you know, raindrops. And these at the same time uses, you know, physical uh, properties that, uh, you know, you can be used for, you know, uh, like engineering simulation or fluid dynamics and so on and so on and so on. And, uh, but then I think that at the moment the world is, and this is a more aesthetic question, but the world I think is split between, you know, uh, the ones that can, uh, you know, uh, think of, you know, uh, modeling, uh, uh, producing, and also in a way, uh, 3D engineering and something that can simply lead, you know, to hyper-realistic images. So not objects, but, uh, you know, something that fits in some part of your eyes as a sold image. And, um, you know, an, an entire other part of the world that, uh, you know, in which, you know, from SOLIDWORKS to any other CAD CAM aided software, uh, in which uh, engineering building and, uh, you know, modifying geometrical representation and using mathematical and statistic patterns in order to achieve, you know, better performance and zero loss when you build something, have a complete, uh, in a way, codified anti-aesthetical mode. So they're not rendered. They use the, less, the least amount of, I believe, CPU uh, needed to visualize the files. And I wonder if also based uh, on, you know, your work experience at, uh, or your uh, collaboration with Vito Consi and uh, the early starts of, um, in a way, computer, you know, uh, core uh, architecture, if uh, in the designing of end topology, if there is any sort of aesthetical value so if you ever thought of, you know, creating a sort of uh, software environment that um, also in a way predated, could predate all the engineering and avoid any aesthetical involvement with, you know, the contemporary way 3D artists use softwares, but also redefine the aesthetic of what we see when, uh, you know, we think of 3D designing. Like is the software able to produce a new way of working essentially? Yeah, not really. I'm, I wonder if yeah. you have any intelligence or if you ever thought uh, on um, concept of aesthetics and rendering. So I wonder if, uh, if there is a reason why uh, software that are specifically designed for engineering have a specific aesthetic value. I got so, it. So I mean, it's, I've co of course, so like it's design software at the end of the day, right? Like yeah. it is. Yeah, like, yes. uh, and in fact, a lot of people get in like get introduced to NTOP because of what they're seeing, because the models that you can produce in NTOP, you can't produce in any other tool. And they've never seen models that like, you show somebody a heating, like, in fact, we have these amazing, um, like incredibly smart user, people who use our software in Northern Italy, Punto Zero AM and the pictures they post 
on LinkedIn and, uh, and, and Instagram and Twitter are like of these like heat exchangers that they're designing that have these crazy structures that are pulling that, that help the airflow through a heat exchanger are like nothing that anybody in engineering has ever seen before. And so I think that in and of itself is what's, you know, pulling the industry forward also. Um, you know, the other thing is we have a lot of engineers that develop the software that are from this, this demo scene, which is all about using the computer to produce these, like the craziest possible image on a GPU. And they're all amazing GPU developers. And a lot of them use the same modeling technology that we use, sign distance field modeling. And so part of what we're seeing is like bringing, you know, bringing the graphics world into engineering and bringing engineering world into graphics and having those two, like anytime you're bringing these two, like at NTOP, we have people that are like, you know, math PhDs, we have mechanical engineering PhDs, and then we have these like graphics geniuses. Um, and pulling them together is what, what produces this incredible software. And I think it's, it's it, you can't separate like what people see in the rendering from like what they're actually making. Like the, the, the other difference with NTOP is it's not just a rendering that stays in the computer. You can, you're building something that's meant for the physical world, right? And so the NTOP is kind of an interface between what's in, all this incredible work that's done in graphics and 3D printers that now can make this stuff. And the model has to be a real, that's, that's where the engineering comes in. The model has to be a real model. The physics is tied into the model. You know, we yeah. have this term field, dri field driven design where yeah. the fields from like, you know, if you, me if you measure the temperature in a room, the temperature is changing, right? You could change, if you're in architecture, you could like change the wall to respond to that. Or you can, you know, if you're making a heat exchanger and you want the heat to like be pulled in a certain direction, you can use the physics, the analysis of that heat of where air is flowing through a heat exchanger and actually change the structure so that the structure is more porous in certain areas and more less porous in other areas to have maximal heat exchange, right? Yeah, I was drawn to to, to the software also because of, uh, you know, this sort of uh, um, idea of zero loss. So you don't have any, because every time uh, we use, uh, you know, even, you know, for rendering or for, you know, banal CAD designs or 3D drawing, I think that generally there is a complete loss that has to deal with uh, projection and B-Rap, as you said. And I think that um, at the end, the software platform you developed is something that uh, centers perfectly on the concept of a new materiality, which is a totally digital or engineering materiality. And um, I think that uh, the biggest aesthetic achievement of NTOP uh, is the fact that it's about the minimum amount of loss that, uh, you know, from digital to reality. And I think that uh, this makes a case uh, for, um, you know, something that we were looking at as uh, the sort of uh, solidification of, or in a way, the uh, consolidation of uh, the computer generated images and the practices and engineering that revolves around them as a kind of new materiality that as no sort of unrestrained approach between real and you know engineering production and whatever, and we think of that as a sort of you know me Freddy Nils as a sort of um, second degree creative industrial class, and uh, I think that you made an achievement of that. And I wonder if you have any uh, sort of if you can expand on the concept of loss between you know your software and actually the reality of making it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think that's a really good way to put it. Is like we capture the actual a real version uh, when if if real means in the physical world existing you know engineering software up until today has made essentially a, a drawing representation of what's real the ntop model is creating like the actual real physical model that can be made now there still is some loss right like it's not like because at the end of the like ultimately from this digital file, you're sending some computer code to tell a laser to move, to melt metal and combine that metal together and build that, right? Or you're you know, sending a set of instructions to a 
a spinning drill that's going to like cut away all the material of a of a block to cut your part out and so you still get to deter like if the if the model is actually like the reality the 3d model in ntop is the reality of what a thing is you then can determine how close to that reality you want to make that thing in the physical world right because you can say you know what i'm going to cut it out with a drill bit that's like gigantic and i can only do five passes of my drill bit and now all of a sudden you know i can only resolve features that are big but if you want to you, you get to pick right because the model is like more real than reality actually right the model is perfection in some ways or weird like it's this perfect mathematical model i think that's get, the it's like it by the way it's like a it's like a it's like a print right if you're printing you know your printer might have a dpi dots per inch and if you print something at 100 dots per inch it's going to look very different than if you print it at you know 600 dots per inch versus if you printed it at 10 dots per inch and so the the text that you're printing that you write is the reality yet when you print it you're basically making a a version of that that you as the engineer get to decide now what's cool even like is you could do a simulation of what that print is and start to understand what the material properties are of the copy of your real perfection model what were you going to say it's really the 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 kind of um the, the experience of the software is that you really feel that the model is always perfect. It's like a pure mathematical. And then, you know, the way you represented the rendering you see on your screen, you can set like the degree of precision you want to have. Uh, so you always set it like to the minimum so you can see what you're doing, but actually um, you can feel you can, you know, you, you can never reach, your computer is never powerful enough. You know, your screen is never powerful enough to show the thing in a full resolution. And I think it's the same thing uh, when you print it in a 3D, uh, when you go, you know, I went to the Frankfurt uh, um, uh, 3D printing fair to meet Brad there. And I saw like hundreds and hundreds of different products printed. And it's really interesting because they all like are fighting to approximate this purity, like the, the, the to, to augment the resolution, but none of them managed to reach that. And I think the end top is really, I mean, when you work on it, it's like you, it's like this kind of infinite resolution. You play with infinite resolution. By the way, that's actually a, a very good point because even the screen that you're rendering it on is a, like the, the perfect model exists in math, right? And the screen, like if I render my model on a screen that's 1920 by 1080, it's going to be different than if I render my model on a screen that's 800 by 600, same, same analogy. So even the rendering itself is a view into what you're doing. It just so happens that we could real time render that and you're seeing the, the model, but you're constantly like we, I guess in like the most simple terms we have, we have this like really perfect math model and we're always trying to like, as, compu as computers evolve, we're getting closer and closer to what that is, but like it's, we'll, we'll never get a hundred percent there. Right. Because we're still viewing this thing through computers and sending it to a machine to make it but that's so that's what's so interesting because engineering itself always works with tolerances right we have tolerance in engineering the idea of tolerance is like a little bit of wiggle room right and so even in engineering we can make these like crazy planes and things that fly at multiple speed of set like multiples of the speed of sound yet those are all built with the tolerance they're not built to perfection so it's Oh, I think that's kind of a, and architecture too, I guess. Buildings too, right? Oh, a Bradley, a completely. Uh, sorry to interrupt. A completely different question because you know, my, personally, I never used any of these devices, so I'm, I have no idea of the whole technical reason. But also, Luigi, during like the whole preparation of the Sturm und Drang project, he was always really obsessed with the idea: of what is the cultural affinity or the cultural obsessions? of all these CGI engineers, which are kind of invisible in a way. So I'm quite curious, like in your team, like how would you describe the cultural affinities of you and your team members? What kind of music, what kind of film, what kind what of do art? What do you read? <laughs> like, I just eat, I eat like shtetl food. I eat, I eat like Russian dumplings <laughs> every day <laughs> and blintzes. No, but, but uh, it's very really important because uh, uh, we always think that, uh, uh, you know, it's like 
NTOP. So NTOP is a set of procedures that brings us to, you know, perfect uh, infinite resolution. Uh, but at the same time, like your company or the developers, the coders and everything is a sort of another set of resolutions that uh, are, you know, apart from, you know, the mathematical obsession that drives them in, I think that uh, what we're doing with this show is trying also to understand what are the patterns, what do they do? Because we think it's relevant to understand uh, not really the software itself, but the, the culture behind the software. I mean, I think at, at NTOP, it's people that are obsessed, like they know what's possible with these perfect mathematical models. Like they know the range of products and the range of stuff, whether it's in aerospace, whether it's in automotive, whether it's in consumer electronics, whether it's in footwear, whether it's in medical, you know, whether it's implants that are used to like fix people's backbones that are broken, or if someone needs a knee replacement, the, you know, a 3D printed metal knee. So it's uh, the thing that aligns everybody at the company or the thing that everybody at the company is obsessed with is what's the next generation of products that are going to be enabled by our technology. And they know, what the tech is capable of but each team the 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 cult that so that's like the single thing is this pursuit of like what is the next generation of products that are possible but the cultures across the teams are very like you know the the engineers that are developing gpu code from demo scene that culture is very different than like the application engineers that are going on site with like you know a lockheed martin and helping them to design next generation helicopters, even though they're I both- the, the demo scene uh, example is very interesting because uh, you know I don't know if you're familiar with the demo scene, but it's like a, a subculture of uh, rendering on like very um, in-girl style uh, where you know you have a, I don't know, 50 kilobyte file or something like this, and you have to make uh, the highest image, highest quality rendered image for the longest time with sound based on a 50 kilobyte file or something like this. Uh, it's a bit distorted description, but you know, I know that one of your guy, your lead engineer in uh, terms of the visualization is actually uh, like coming, like it's kind of a, a celebrity on the kind of on that demo scene. And I find it really interesting because, you know, his kind of medium is to like push uh, hardware uh, to the maximum. Uh, with the minimum file size and that's his art form and it's something that's completely um, uh, and then somehow you work with him as a way to like uh, maximize the the software but but he coming is coming from some sort of creative subculture basically right <laughs> yeah no but the question was much more general Brad, because uh, uh, we have been uh, you know discussing cgi with artists uh, and, uh, you know, we've been, this project is about all the people that so more or less use softwares uh, um, to sort of, you know, upgrade or create a sort of, uh, you know, pristine reality, whether it is material uh, engineering or, you know, uh, Hollywood based. So we, we had the chance to speak with the Disney research uh, laboratories and uh, but they have a very similar approach to you. And um, what we discovered is that at a certain point, you know, artists working with CGI, they can speak about the culture, but can speak truly about softwares. While um, uh, we discovered that, you know, something that uh, goes into the corporate world or extremely and obsessively mathematical, um, in a way, inputs and codes, they, uh, at the same time, uh, they are sort of, you know, foreign to understanding what are uh, uh, the cultural implications, you know, apart from their field uh, of what can happen. And uh, because I think that uh, the, another reason why uh, I was incredibly obsessed with NTOP was the fact that today, the only way we can show, for instance, uh, CGI or 3D files into like a museum or an exhibition is only through animation. Mm. And, um, you know, animation is uh, simply, you know, a rendered format, uh, uh, you know, a processed view and something that is pre-recorded. And um, this entire process is about, uh, also this show, is about um, trying to, you know, find ways or, you know, correct devices or infrastructure to showcase something in a museum or as an exhibition technology that could display, you know, reality as it is. And uh, your software, I think that, uh, you know, apart from the uh, obsessive engineering uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, drive to that uh, could be expanded in order to, you know, provide a set of, uh, um relevant uh, uh breakthrough 
in the way we can show things live, but you know, not made in reality. So no more motion, no more recordings, no more video, raw, uh, in a way, 3D materiality. By the way, that's, so that's exactly it, right? Like if you're, you know, we've seen movies that are done with CGI for the last 15 years that produce these amazingly realistic looking, like quote unquote, realistic looking objects. The issue is if you're engineering a part for an airplane or for a car, you need that like real time interaction. You need that reality in the actual model. That's never existed in CAD because CAD is a drawing of something that's real. And that hasn't existed in animation because animation is, you know, you're pre-recording it to make it look good. And you can do all this post-process retouching and stuff. And so I think that's actually, it is like the, the engineering drive behind NTOP has pushed us in order to like make a model that actually captures what is real. That's why we can make something like a bone implant that actually is like bone. It's not just a drawing of what bone looks. It's not just the drawing of the outside. And, and so that's why that, we were interested in, uh, you know, speaking with you, because I think that, uh, you know, we are aiming at, you know, discovering patterns by which with the same, you know, 3D file, you could render an Hollywood movie, but also, you know, uh, send things to production. And this is our aim, you know, with this exhibition project and show and, you know, academical uh, research studio. And we think that um, at the moment, uh, uh, what we are missing uh, is uh, a sort of you know codified uh, cultural approach uh, that could match uh, you know the mathematical drive or you know the corporate drive that lies between or behind the softwares and um and basically that's it so i simply wonder you know but this is a very honest question and uh, because uh, you know when you make a software you can you know people can um, you know mismatch dryness uh, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, seriousness, uh, seriousness, mathematical drive, etc. But I'm truly curious of, you know, really, what do you read and what do people do? So what, uh, in a way, lies or what can drive you, you know, outside of, you know, being inside this sort of, you know, uh, scene? So what are your personal inputs or what are, you know, the personal connection that we have with other disciplines that sort of, you know, get you out of the bed in the morning and put new force into end top? Like from really, it can really be something very silly. Maybe it's your latte in the morning. But um, I think that an entire spectrum of the culture that provides us with the technology that um, we could use to build better things or to engineer better things, we are missing all the personal, uh, um, in a way, all the geographical notes. And so, in a way, it seems that, you know, if you could, if you create software, if you are in the engineering world, it's like you don't have a life and you don't have any aesthetical or cultural drive. And so other like artists can appropriate it. So I'm very curious to know what is basically your cultural background? What do you read? Uh, what, maybe it's comics, maybe it's, you know, Hollywood uh, fucked off movie or whatever. So I'm very curious. So uh, have you seen the movie Uncut Gems? Yeah. That, that, that would describe the, my cultural, what I'm interested in. Just some like fucked up movie about, like I'm Jewish, I grew up Jewish in a Jewish family, but it's like a fucked up movie with good, interesting music in it. And so I think that's high a good- speed. High speed as well. Yeah, high speed, kind of like it's funny, but it's also fucked up, but it's, it's, it's funny in some ways. So I think that's, that's probably a good, that's for that. Does, and that's not the whole, that's like me personally. And like, okay. like I said, the thing that gets people excited across the company is like new, new but that, that doesn't that, like, if you look at my apartment, I don't have, I don't even have a computer in my apartment other than my laptop. You know what I mean? Like everything's at, at. The, like I don't wear an, an iPhone watch and I don't have like a Amazon, like I, just because I'm interested in creating the software behind creating all these new advanced products like airplanes. And and I'm, but also like for me, I've always been obsessed with airplanes. Like I, like SR-71 Blackbird is like the most amazing yeah. aircraft. I think I was like, when I was eight, I made a drawing of it. It's at my parents' house. So it's hilarious. It's kind of funny to see that. And so, I think that obsession has driven this, but like my, within my personal life, like I don't have like an Amazon echo at my house. I don't have this like tech 
house. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. But some, I'm sure some people at our company maybe, probably do. Uh, you know, when you were working at Vito Acconci just after you graduated, you know, you were, I think, the head of the office, more or less. Uh, and uh, But you were also helping him develop all these very organic parametric shape. There is like this kind of a, um, you know, there is a very specific, like, kind of uh, aesthetic to that, you know. And, um, and I wonder... Um, you know, I wonder if that's still like, you know, and Vito Acconci is not like, you know, is a pretty specific, I mean, I, you know, he's, uh, you know, uh, he has his performance side, but he also has his uh, kind of a design side, which is very organic. And, um, and I wonder if it's something you come back to uh, when, for example, say you designed a user interface or even like things like that, maybe it's like, is it like a, uh, on, on the mood board? Uh, or... Actually, I don't have I don't have a mood board. <laughs> well, I wish maybe I'll make one. But anthropology is uh, you know it's really like uh, you know uh, Dan Scott or extreme realism. So is um, I think that uh, what uh, what uh, we are getting out of this is that uh, uh, there are ways by which uh, uh, you know work on um, you know perfecting or optimization over, you know, platforms that can streamline production, you know, for the future are, um, in a way, a new emergent pattern, which uh, basically you can get, you know, uh, you know, the personal out of it. And so I, because generally I, I always thought that, you know, for everybody, you know, working behind the computer, they will have a set of, you know, uh, books that they love, uh, a set of, you know, uh, things that they have a sort of obsession with, you know, as with all other mandatory things. But I, I'm seeing that uh, we are, you know, changing the sort of, you know, biographical patterns by which, you know, the new generation that are working behind computers uh, uh, have a culture that is completely, you know, generated or into the software in itself as, um, you know, a bearer of values that, uh, you know, maybe personally I cannot get, uh, but this to us is extremely interesting because this means that optimization works across from, you know, software to reality, actually to the personal behavior and patterns of the people that work in these factories and companies. And to me, this is uh, truly interesting. Okay. It's thank incredible. you so much. Yeah, it's great to meet you guys. Octav, thanks for setting this up. Of and course. We'll, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, good to meet uh, you guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you. Bye.